Over 2,000 years ago, two disillusioned disciples walked along a dusty road to Emmaus. They had just witnessed Jesus, their friend and leader, whom they hoped to be the Messiah, suffer a gruesome death by crucifixion. Doubt, fear, and uncertainty clouded their conversation as they journeyed home questioning the future. Until something miraculous happened. The risen Jesus appeared and answered their questions. Today, many young Catholics step onto college campuses with numerous questions about their faith, yearning to know if the seed of faith given to them as a child is both true and practical. Using the miracle on the road to Emmaus as a model, young adult ministers conversed weekly for three months with college students about the most pressing questions they had about the Catholic faith. As they journeyed together virtually, something amazing happened. Doubts disappeared, fears faded, and Jesus revealed that he is still alive. Hearts Burning Within Us, the latest book from Patchwork Heart Ministry, scheduled to be released in the summer of 2021, is a result of that grace-infused conversation. To pre-order your copy and help spread the word about the book, visit patchworkheart.org. Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Ann DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sewing Hope Podcast. I am Bill Snyder. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, no matter where you're listening from, thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel here and listening live, or if you are listening later on uh, any of the great podcast apps, thank you for tuning in to Patchwork Art Radio and being here uh, this evening. As always, I'm joined by my uh, good friend and co-host, Andy Santos. And how are you this evening? Oh, awesome. I'm awesome. As I said, every time we're getting closer to April, I'm going to be more awesome and happy. Yeah. Yeah. The snow came back here in Wisconsin today, though. We had uh, we had another inch, inch of snow last night. So <laughs> I scraped oh. my car again this morning. But, but here well, we our are. guest understands that well, too, because she's coming to us from Ohio. We have Erin Brostel, and she is a Catholic author, Michigan native. Uh, she is a busy homeschooling mother of eight children, an active volunteer at St. Patrick's Parish in downtown Columbus, Ohio. The author of an award-winning children's book, God Made the Moonlight, Erin is the co-founder of Perpetual Light Publishing, a Catholic publishing service specializing in children's and young adult literature. Welcome, Erin. Thank you so much for joining us on Sewing Hope. Thanks, Ann and Bill. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we have so much to talk about, uh, and uh, I think you're doing amazing work, and one of your good friends was a guest here also, Jean Egoff. Say hello to her. I'm sure she's listening. Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. She's good friends with us, too, and uh, we always start out with on this show, we love to hear the stories of your faith journey, and I know you're the mother of eight and busy homeschooling mom. Uh, I myself am a, you know, was a homeschooling mother and I do miss it. And I love to hear about that. I love to hear about homeschooling and kind of wish, you know, to be back in the trenches of it, That's right. uh, <laughs> but would love to hear your faith journey. Well, I was raised Episcopalian. My mom was Episcopalian and a Sunday school teacher and my dad was Catholic. So we went to both churches, but I was confirmed uh, Episcopalian, as was my brother, and I became Catholic at 19, and so did my mom. So we were both reconfirmed. We went through RCIA the same year, and I was walking around at the big, bad University of Michigan campus, and I saw literally everybody. I could have become Zen Buddhist. I could have become Benibrith. 
I went into an Episcopal church in Ann Arbor and there was no one there. <laughs> I think there might have been one 80 year old lady and that was it. And I walked out saying, okay, Lord, where do you want me? And then I walked into the Newman Center right off campus and I saw the children and I realized that the families were there and I had one, I was a film major. So I had one film school TA who was nice Latino young man and he brought his three little kids to mass and I thought that's it. I'm supposed to, I'm Irish Catholic. Basically I should be Catholic, right? And I <laughs> said, I said, Lord, I don't want a church shop my whole life. So, you know, show me. And he did. And so I became Catholic and I have loved every minute of homeschooling, even the crazy days. You look back on it and go, I don't know how I did that, but <laughs> the kids, you know, they're still learning. It's all good, even in the time of COVID. So this is my 16th year of homeschooling. Wow. And our oldest wow. is in college and she did great on the SAT. Yay. Proud mom moment. Praise God. Uh -huh. And That's my awesome. littlest is three years old and potty training. So <laughs> I am in <laughs> all of it right now. The, probably the busiest, this is going to be the busiest five to 10 years of my life. And after that, it'll be much different when they start moving out. <laughs> So, Absolutely. And, and well, yes. thank you for finding the time to uh, be with us tonight, Erin, because You're I know welcome. that's that's, <laughs> um, that's a busy schedule. I'm, I'm getting ready for a little one, uh, my my first little one uh, coming here uh, in early May. And, and, and I'm kind of freaking out. So I can't imagine what, uh, you know, feeding seven lo looks like and then schooling <laughs> them and everything else. So. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you for the time. Congratulations, by the way, Bill, to you and your wife. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say, uh, as excited as, as Bill and his wife Agnes are, I have been so very excited for Bill, too, <laughs> because right now Bill is that one person I know that they're expecting their baby in a couple months. So I'm already kind of collecting my little gifts and, and things like that. So we're rooting for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's so you. much fun. It is. Um, so, uh, you know, on the topic of family life and, and being a Catholic mom and being so immersed in, you know, Catholic culture and in writing, um, explain to us what it's like for you just on a day-to-day -day basis as well, uh, being that, you know, the mother, but also the writer too. I've been writing for a very long time. I mean, probably it does feel like since I was in second grade or whatever, I was writing creative stories and I write the occasional bit of poetry, either good or bad. <laughs> and um, I, I had all these children and I've, it's been a progression. You know, nobody, God does not usually give people eight kids all at once. It's a slow progression. And over time I thought I have a wealth of sort of information and experience and I want to write children's books for my kids if for nobody else. And I, I wrote God Made the Moonlight when my fifth daughter was small. She was nursing and I was up at two in the morning looking at the moon through my window and I've always liked the moon and I thought I, I should just write, just write, write. It took me you know, several nights worth of trying to get ideas down on paper and writing a story. And then like almost all writers I know, it sat there for nine years before I published it. <laughs> so in between that, I've written things for other people. I've written some articles. I used to work with Patrick Madrid from um, Envoy Magazine, and he had me do some copy editing. And then one of his writers, unfortunately, passed away, and he gave me the opportunity to interview people and write for the Diplomatic Corps Department which was so much fun. I got to read all the most brilliant people in Envoy Magazine, like Dr. Peter Kreeft and Father Andrew Apostoli. And um, I got to interview people like Stephanie Wood. She's from a famous um, pro-life family. And it was a lot of fun. Wow. So I just do things here and there. You know, I, I always say you can accomplish more in 10 minutes when you're determined <laughs> than hours of wasting time, right? I, I was always one of those kids with a book in my hand or you know, a book in one room and another book in another room and <laughs> just read just read a little bit and I get, I get a lot of reading done. So that's how I do this. And I homeschool, I love homeschooling. And my kids are all pretty independent too because I don't teach all subjects all the time. That would be insane. And I know very few homeschooling mothers who do that. I use like math DVDs to teach math and I just facilitate. I don't teach. I can teach all the way through elementary school and then they get either tutors or they get help from their dad or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, my oldest daughter hated math and now she's going to be a computer engineer, which is just amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, 
You never know where God will lead you. I think that's a good, that's a good quote too, is that don't forget God is homeschooling along with you. And if your kids can't learn something or they really struggle, maybe they don't need to know that. Maybe they have other talents or, you know, you homeschool so you can push them towards their talents and let them have more time to do something, which is amazing to watch. If, if anybody out there listening can actually try homeschooling, I highly recommend it. Even if it's just for a few months, uh, it's so worth it especially in the end. And now that we've graduated one, I'm like, yay, <laughs> for, all, yeah. for all those doubters, hey, she's going to college, so. No, I agree with you completely. And um, I'm, I don't have quite as big a family as you have two daughters, but we did homeschool both of them. And it was a wonderful experience. And uh, exactly what you said, you know, the talents really kick in, don't they? I mean, those God-given mm-hmm. talents just kick in, uh, whatever they are, you know, and um and homeschooling works. It does. It really I, does. Have, it works. I have no doubts and I am not worried. I do not rigorously test my kids in every single subject because some of it is overkill. We tried 12 weeks of online public school and all they did was test them and teach them how to take tests. And I saw no results after three months. It was boring and tough and common core math was horrible and my kids begged me to go back to homeschooling so I did and no regrets that was our online experiment and I can't answer to 20 different teachers worth of email every day that's impossible there I feel bad for the public school teachers because they're asking them to do the impossible with all this paperwork and all the things they have to do and now all the cleaning of their classrooms and all the crazy stuff they have to do and I am not going to put my kids in a bubble so that's why we're still home and I'm glad we are. So yeah, yeah, praise God, praise God. Um, on that topic uh, of, of learning, uh, is like you said, reading, and it's such an important thing that, you know, you, from an early age, it sounds like you love to read and you instill that in your kids. So I do love to read. I I would be a library (laughs) lady if I wasn't a homeschooler, because I'd be reading to kids. I read to my kids every night. And my husband does too. Sometimes we trade off kids. He was reading the Hardy Boys with one of our sons. Uh, and I was reading a story about Father Marquette a while ago to our oldest son, who's now 16. But they hopefully have developed a love for reading. And I've really seen that. And it doesn't really matter how you get them to learn. The important thing is that they can learn, even if they have eyesight issues or if they really struggle, you know, just keep plowing away because there's no magic age, by the way, when they're supposed to read. There are some eight and 10 year olds who don't read until later and it's perfectly fine. And there are some kids, and I've even had a couple daughters who could start reading at age five and that's unusual uh, in our society usually. Well, I usually don't say this uh, on podcasts, but because she's graduating, I have to mention this, that my youngest was what you just described. She was closer to 10. And I had all kinds of people saying to me that we'd take, get her tested and all these different things. And she went from reading at a very low level, like kindergarten to sixth grade level within months. Yes. So it would happen very yep. quickly. And Absolutely. now in college, um, college was off to a rough start just because she didn't like being away. But when she came home, um, she went from like a 2.5 to a 4.0 almost all the way through. And she's mm-hmm. going to be, uh, yeah. She even may be the speaker at her graduation. So we'll see. We'll see. Hey. But I'm saying for, I understand what you mean about that late reading and, and that you get concerned because people will say things to you like, oh, what are you going to do about it? But, um, you know, God has a plan for all of that. And, you know, everybody learns different ways and at different times. And sometimes those later readers can wind up to be ones that really love it. Yes, that's true. And I I was fortunate because when I started homeschooling, I had a bunch of mentor moms that let me see what they did and read what they were reading. And I was introduced to Maria Montessori, who is a sort of specific teacher. And I didn't do, I did some Montessori science. I put my kids in a couple of classes when they were very little, like three and four. And we did some things. But the important thing about those older ladies who saw so many kids that they taught is they're the ones who said, Hey, they're 10. Don't worry about it. They'll read eventually. No, don't stress about it because you want them to love reading no matter what age they start. And some kids great. And some kids really like to listen because then there's the difference between visual learners, auditory learners and kinesthetic learners. And that is huge in my homeschool. 
because some kids, you could talk at them all day. It goes in one ear and out the other. It doesn't matter. Or they have to actually touch it. They have to manipulate it. They have to see it. And I'm a very visual learner too. So I, I've i had some challenges with the kids who do not learn like I do and trying to um, change it up for them or let them do it at their own pace or have somebody else teach them because I'm like, I'm the camp director here. <laughs> I don't have to do it all. The important thing is knowing when you need help, right? Did you find that too? Like you had to hire stuff out or things that you're not good at. You just get other people to teach them. Yeah. And I think I, I absolutely, we did at one point, we even had a tutor for a little while, but what you just said about the auditory visual and the tactile, I think is absolutely true. And um, I, myself, I mean, obviously being podcast host and everything and, and loving music, that was my thing. And I can listen to books. I do audible. I love listening to books. And I think what I learned from that is I myself am more auditory. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, li- I I tend to remember what I hear. I, Bill's nodding his head. I think he is too. I'm auditory, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and see, both I'm, are. Yeah. I'm visual, so if I see a movie on the history, I can remember all the characters and what they said. Mm-hmm. I just have to see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, yeah. there you go. It and but it's different, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, I, one of the things I think is really interesting that you really both touched on. But Erin, you talked a little bit about you know, like, like, like some of the deficiencies and some of the weaknesses, you know, oftentimes, you know, our, our school systems, our society is in general, like pushing people to, to learn something that they're just not going to grasp, right? Like they're just, it, mm-hmm. it's not their skill. It's not their talent. And the, the beautiful thing is that, you know, it's almost just like what you're talking about. Okay. Like we're going to have somebody else come in and teach them this because it's not my strength either. And, right. and, you know, we don't, I, I think we don't do enough to build up the strengths of, of our children and the strengths of our people, because when, when we walk out there, well, you're not good at this. Well, you're not good at that. Well, yeah, I might not be good at these things, but guess what? I'm, I'm going to be, you know, some area that you're weak, I'm going to be able to excel and, and maybe you can help me with my weakness and just be able to do that. Exactly. And, and, exactly. And and so I think for I, I think for people to recognize that even look, even if you're not homeschooling, you know, I wasn't homeschooled and uh, or whatever. But I mean, you know, the reality is like, OK, you know, maybe you're sending your kids to public school, maybe you're sending them to a private Catholic school. But you know what? Have, have a serious conversation with the you know teachers and stick up for your kids in, in those areas. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, like, it, like it's not just a homeschooling thing. It's it, it's sticking up for your kids, loving your kids like it, it, it's OK not to be good at everything. You know, right. you do not have to be uh, an, a, an A student across the board in every single subject. Right. Right. And I went all the way through public school, too. And it, now that I've been homeschooling, I kind of regret that I was. But yet God had me do that for a reason, because now I can speak to both sides. I graduated in sort of the top of my class, but I was one of those kids who got an A in everything or almost an A in everything. And then I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 18. And that's the classic homeschooling argument of like, why waste all that time? Or if you have multiple talents, but you literally don't know what direction to start in because it was all about the grades and the tests. And it's great that I had a, you know, 4.2, but I didn't know what to do with it. So (laughs) Um, and I had a few people encourage me, but I, I ended up being a film major. I graduated from U of M with one of the coolest majors. And then I went out to Hollywood to work for a year and a half in audio. And <laughs> that was a good experience. God, my guardian angel was like literally right over me all the time. I survived an earthquake, uh, the traffic, uh, Hollywood in general. You know, I had people who watched out for me. I had a couple really nice um, people who are my friends. And it's like they say, if you're friends in Hollywood, they'll give you the shirt off their back because it's, it's a rough town. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. God bless you. Really, honestly, God bless you. And you're doing such an amazing job. You're a wonderful mother. I mean, that's first and foremost, right? Your faith being a wife and a mother and, and, and your writing so we'd love to hear also how the writing came about. If you could tell us that story, we'd love to hear. Sure. Um, so I met Jeannie. Let me tell you this story because it goes with the writing. I met Jeannie at a horse camp. She's very. She was very into horses and she was doing a 
thing where kids could come in the summer and learn how to take care of rescue horses, but not ride them. They were the kind like, let's learn how to clean out a stall and pick up after them and walk them around maybe. But it, it was, that was really interesting. And then several years later, she came to our parish, St. Patrick's in downtown Columbus. And she has two daughters and I have five daughters. And we started talking and eventually got to be friends. And I showed her my God made the moonlight book and she wanted to illustrate it. God bless her. <laughs> so <laughs> she did a wonderful job of illustrating it. It took her a long time. This is really well done. And she helped me get it published and get started. And then we started talking about how, you know, there are so many people who want to be published in the Catholic world. And I was rejected 13 times with this book, which actually is not very much. You hear stories of hundreds of rejections, but everybody told me this is not Catholic enough. And I was, I was puzzled by that. And I thought about it. I'm like, okay, my book is for, you know, newborns to five years old. It's a read aloud. It's essentially like good night moon. It's about God and a little girl's relationship with him and realizing how he created nature, but he's watching over her like the moon is watching over her. It's a very kind of deep, profound thing that it actually happened to me that way when I was a little girl. I'm, I'm writing as if I was seven years old. And I thought to myself, we really need to start a company that focuses on all of the Catholic topics, not just the saints whom I love and the sacraments, which are very important. But literally, there are Catholic catalogs out there that have nothing else. It's the saints or the sacraments. And we have to compete with all these things now and the computer games and the world creation that people do really well. And it, we have to do it all. So Jeannie and I talked about it and decided to start Perpetual Light Publishing and try and pay authors and illustrators what they're worth because it's really hard to do that. In the Catholic world, a lot of people do things for free and they're very talented and that's great. But when you're a mom of a big family and you have medical bills, <laughs> you know, you have to, or like Jeannie, your mom with a family and you have things happen, you've got to have a way to make a living. So we decided to try this and it seems like it's going to work because God is leading us in all these different directions and leading people to us. And I'm very excited about it. I have several projects right now I'm working on and it's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you tell us about those projects? Mm -hmm. I can. I'm working on a young adult novel. It is an adventure story. And as a homeschooling mom, we get asked all the time, we need more books for our boys. How, have you heard that? Because everybody says that. Yeah, I hear people say things like that. Yeah. More books for boys. And this is a story about a little Hebrew boy who wants to be a treasure hunter and he wants to go find the Ark of the Covenant and he wants to go meet Jesus. And he, it's this journey story to Jerusalem. But unfortunately, Jesus dies before he, the little boy, Eli, can get to Jerusalem. But then there's this whole story about him and all the things that happen after the resurrection. And it is such a cool book, you know, a classic adventure journey tale. It's really going to be good. That one is going to come out in September, hopefully. And I'm working on a fantasy book. And how often have you guys heard of a really good Catholic fantasy allegory like C.S. Lewis, but for younger children? Not often Not at often, all. No. Not at all. Well, you can count it on one hand, probably, mm -hmm. the number of authors who've even tried that. And I'm excited that that might be a possibility in the future. And this author has written essentially four novellas. And it could easily be made into a TV show audiobooks <laughs> it's be really good and it's on the rosary and it's a fantasy story about the rosary but with very clearly delineated you know good and evil and characters that fall in love and have a family and characters that are fighting evil and um it, it's really good and i think that in order to get our kids to imagine heaven you kind of have to have it, it helps sometimes to have that fantasy background and i love fantasy and sci-fi so, and not very many people do, I'm finding in the Catholic world, there's a few of us, but um, if you're going to imagine heaven, you got to go some, right? It can't just be boring old puffy clouds and what are we going to do? We're going to sit up there and sing with the angels. I mean, there's a lot more to heaven, I'm sure. And the authors that can bring that out are really amazing. And um, again, you're competing with video games where people are creating whole worlds or universes and these kids know every single character out of a hundred characters and all their talents and what they do. And meanwhile, they pick up a book that's Catholic. That's really boring sometimes. Right. Exactly. I mean, no. you know, we have to do better than that. So Jeannie and I are really excited to work with some good writers 
And we're working on a series on the rosary with Kathy Gilmore, who is the- Oh yeah, Kathy. She's the head of Vir Virtue Works Media. And um, she's an, a fantastic author and she's working on, st um, we started with uh, The Annunciation, mm. um, A Mouse and a Miracle it's called. And then Wisdom Finds a Way, which is on The Three Wise Men and Amel the Camel. And each of these books have a cute little animal character that goes along with the story, the holy story and the mysteries of the rosary. So that's going to be a fantastic series when we get done with it. <laughs> it's really good. We are two books and then we're working on the third one right now. So awesome. Oh, my gosh. You know, oh it's so great. And, you know, one of the one of the things that I really love, you, you mentioned you're competing with video games and you're competing with movies and, you know, where where it seems like and and, and you, you know, as a film major, too, that we're we're almost hijacking the imagination of, of kids and, and, and putting it on a screen. You know, I, the other night, uh, just so happened that Harry Potter was on and my wife is a Harry Potter fan and she's watching it on, on the screen, uh, you know, on, on the TV and on the screen. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, I, I bet you if I read the book that, you know, this, this world in my head would look different than what is on the screen. And, and what we've done, I think, as a culture is we've pushed people into these video games, into these movies, where, where we're now watching someone else's imagination on, on the screen, and, and that's the only thing they can think of. You know, you know that's the movie that replays in, in their head constantly, and you know, we were talking about thinking, you know, in, uh, or, or, or relating to the world, you know, auditory, visual, uh, you mm -hmm. know, tactile, and, and there was a, it was really funny, there was an article that came out uh, somebody sent it to me that say uh, uh, the majority of Americans now have to think in pictures, like yeah, uh, like I saw in that movie too, pictures. Bill, I saw that, and and and, mm -hmm. and it's so it's so interesting to me that you know this is where we're going, where we're like hijacking the imagination, where where we're no longer able to walk with an author through a land because because clearly they see something different. I like like I bet you you know that that sci-fi novel you're talking about coming out you know they're going to paint a picture and then I get to draw that picture in my mind and you get to draw it in yours mm -hmm. and it's not going to look the same on the screen you know mm -hmm. of our minds you know and that's the I think that's the beautiful thing about great books and great writing and I personally I don't read a lot of fiction books I it's just not my cup of tea but um but I do recognize that we need to have great fiction and we need to have uh, a, a re-stimulation of especially children's imaginations mm -hmm. and so what you're doing is so is so wonderful because you know uh, y you are certainly competing with that and and I'm glad you know you're competing with it so mm -hmm. that so that you can win the fight right right and I agree I like books and movies and I, I don't really care so much how children's imaginations get stimulated. I would love to see some more Catholic movies, by the way. Um, mm. Especially there's not very many that are, are fantasy based, but, but real and about real virtues and issues. And just like Kathy Gilmore, Jeannie and I are a lot about the virtues. Mm -hmm. um, we have Wendy's Wacky Wardrobe, which is a cute and funny rhyming book, but it's about the virtue of temperance and about how a little girl has too much stuff in her closet and she needs to learn how to give it away. Now that's a good, useful cute and funny girly book that or you know even for anybody for adults or for boys too if you have a boy who's a hoarder <laughs> or something <laughs> too many baseball mitts in the closet yeah. i don't know give it up um and then she she starts for her whole school she starts a, a giveaway program for the clothes it's, it's, it's those kind of things that are good but also just you know, pure fantasy and imagination and getting the kids to imagine heaven and imagine the saints and the saint. I love the saints lives movies because sometimes you just can't picture, you know, Africa with St. Josephine Bakita or, you know, the wild west coast of Scotland or whatever saint. Oh, by the way, my favorite saint book is St. Magnus, the last Viking by Susan Peak. It is fantastic. Go get it for <laughs> yourself or any kid. It is an adventure story for boys and girls, but he was an amazing saint. And Susan Peake's um, mission is to make obscure saints know knowable and recognizable. And she has one on St. Dymphna of Ireland too. It's very good. And um, I'm fortunate to hang out with a lot of these authors online and get to know them a little bit. So 
I'm a big fan of the, the Catholic Writers Guild. Yay, guys. Go, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Bill and I might even be going there this summer. Um, that's another topic. We won't get into that on this show. But um, but I love the fact that you are, you know, you, you said it so well that sometimes we see things like books about the saints and, you know, it's it doesn't present it in a way that makes it exciting or real. Right. right. I want to right. use the word real, mm -hmm. real people, because we have these images of the beautiful images of the saints, but they don't mm -hmm. seem like real people that existed. Right. Right. And right. so the, what you are all doing is something of bringing it to the table and uh, putting it into the imaginations of young people mm -hmm. so that it means something to them. Right. It's not mm -hmm. two separate worlds. And, and, you know, sometimes we tend to put religion on one side and then real life on the other. And I think what you're trying to do is take those two worlds and put them together so that there's not this whole separate religion world and then the regular world. Exactly. Am I right? Then exactly. That's perfect. No, you said it perfectly. That's And that's pretty much the story of my whole life is if you're raised with the faith, it doesn't have to be boring or dull. Boring. A lot of people think it's only rules based and, oh, poor you, you're Christian. You have to follow all these rules. It is so much more than that. It's almost laughable. It's it's like watching Thor for the first time. It's like if our imaginations can come up with this entire movie about the Norse god of thunder and his crazy brother Loki, the god of chaos, and you can come up with all these crazy things, why can we not do that for our Catholic imagination too? Like setting the Catholic imagination free with art and music and writing and poetry and all, all of it. I mean, it's it's quite something when you think of it like that. Like we have a huge 2000 plus year history of art devoted to Jesus and the saints and the Holy Spirit. And most people who've never walked into a, a beautiful Catholic church, when they do finally walk in and they look up, you can see their jaws drop. I've, I've seen that with myself, with friends or with family. And it's just like, wow, what is this? <laughs> what, yeah. Why do you have all this stained glass? Why? What, what's the shamrock doing there? I mean, for St. Patrick's Day tomorrow, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that St. Patrick was uh, the patron saint of Ireland and his whole story being kidnapped by pirates. There's nothing more exciting than that, right? He gets oh, yeah. dragged across the sea to go become a shepherd and then he escapes and he goes back to England and there's nothing boring about St. Patrick. <laughs> oh. So. Oh, he's one of my favorites. Yeah. Not just because I'm part Irish, you know, <laughs> but um, just his story, because his story, I think, relates to what we are all going through right now between secularism, right, and deciding mm -hmm. that you want to be on the side of God and on the side of the church. Mm -hmm. So and our faith and passing on the faith, right, passing yeah. it on. That's the thing that I think you're doing so well with what you're doing with this mission with book writing is that you are doing something for the present moment, right? But mm -hmm. you're doing something for tomorrow too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the tomorrow after that, and after that, and after that. Uh, so that- can in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. You're making a big impact. So, you know, you have that most special book that you wrote. Um, tell us about that. And also tell us about what it was like to write it. So okay. We want to hear as much as we can about this book. So I've always been a space fan or a moon fan, or back in the day, my friends at school used to tease me because I wanted to be an astronaut. And unfortunately, I grew up in the time of Challenger. Uh, Challenger was when I was in fifth grade, and that was very tragic and sad, but I've, I always wanted to um, be involved in space. And I went to Space Academy in eighth grade, which was so much fun. It was a week-long STEM camp for kids. It was very interesting. So I decided to write this book, God Made the Moonlight, and it's a journey story of a little girl who goes to visit her grandparents. And side note, how many books do you know with grandparents in them? There's still not enough. There's a few authors who do, but to include them in family life is really important, I think. So she goes to visit her grandparents, and over the course of the summer, she sees the moon in all its different phases and the, the way that the light hits different things. And like her little brother opens up a jar of fireflies and it's a, the new moon. So the fireflies glow, but the moon doesn't. Um, and, and then she's realizing along the way that God is watching over her, like God made the moon for her and for everybody, of course, but to put yourself, it's, it's told from the viewpoint of a seven-year-old girl seeing things with her eyes. Um, and it's been called atmospheric and 
kind of like God made the moon, um, not uh, kind of like Good Night Moon, which is a, a high compliment. Um, and it's just a fun book to read to your kids. And Jeannie's illustrations are gorgeous watercolor style illustrations of family life and nature and camping outside. And she sees the moon when she's driving in the car on her way back to the airport and all kinds of things. And she sees like the moon fly across, a plane fly across the moon in the airport and things like that. It's just, it's a very sweet book to read to your kids because I love reading to my kids and my little ones just love to snuggle up next to me. And I read to my son right now in the morning because he gets up really early at six o'clock and we usually end up reading a few books before I let him watch TV or make breakfast or whatever. So um, oh, you're doing incredible work. I was just looking at some of the websites where people can purchase the book. So if you're listening and you're thinking, wow, that's a great book. I want to get it. Uh, a couple of places that you can buy that is at perpetual light publishing.com. Now I see another website here. Is it eight hobbits.com? Yes, that's my personal blog. And you can buy the book there through an Amazon link as well. Okay. So go to perpetuallightpublishing.com. They have great books there. And you'll see the books of Aaron Brostel uh, doing amazing work. Um, so uh, tell us, uh, I know you explained a little bit about what's happening this year. Uh, is there anything else that you want to tell us about that's happening in the future? Uh, that That's something they can look out for in 2021, 2022? Um, I will go ahead and ask for prayers for my next book. I'm really kind of in the middle of writing one on St. John Bosco for kids oh. and he's amazing. And I just feel like, again, the boys need a special role model and he kind of was for his time period in Italy and his lessons are still very relevant now. And I want to make a sort of a fun book for boys and girls so that they get to know that particular saint. Um, and let's see what else. So we're still working on the Virtue Heroes books as well. Um, that's going to be fun. Um, and then if I can just mention, Jeannie has her Molly McBride series of books for um, vocations for kids, which is a story oh, about cool. a, a little girl who wants to be a purple nun and her friend Dominic who wants to be a priest. And they're six years old in the beginning book and they, they age through elementary school a little bit. But she has a great one on the Christmas pageant for Catholic parents and grandparents that have their kids in Catholic school. They would like that one very much on the virtue of obedience and following the director's rules in the Christmas pageant. That one is fun. And then we have some, I do um, book reviews for the Catholic Writers Guild on Eight Hobbits and I have some adult books as well. There's Christina Chase's It's Good to Be Here, story of a disabled woman um, and her beautiful faith that she's been compared to St. Therese of the Little Flower. It's kind of her little way. And my friend Keith Berube, who's a theology professor, and he wrote Mary the Beloved. That's another really good book mm. for adults, especially this time of year in Lent, uh, to get closer to Mary. Um, and there are just, there are so many good books that um, if you go to catholicteenbooks.com, all, oh, yes. Catholic all of those authors are brilliant. Some of them yes. are just astonishing. And they have mysteries and clean romances. What we're calling clean romances means it doesn't have any sex in it for younger kids. Um, it might have a kiss at the end, but it's very normal, you know, normal romances. And um, what else? And history, historical fiction is big right now. Um, stories of, of the obscure saints by Susan Peake and stories that would go along with confirmation, which is kind of an interesting thing thing for teen books. Teresa Linden's book, Firestarters, very good, about a bunch of Catholic teens who are trying to help their friends go through confirmation. Um, and they're adventurous. There's nothing boring about these books. None of them. I've read, I think, over 20 books in the last year, and every single one of them is interesting. Um, there's a mystery series by Anthony Kolink called The Harwood Mysteries about a boy in 12th century England whose village burns down and he goes to live with the monks and then goes to solve mysteries. That's like Brother Cadfile. If any of you are Derek Jacoby fans, that was another TV show quite a while ago, but about a monk who solves mysteries. Mm. Um, there's just, there are so many good things in Catholic literature and hopefully to come more to come in children's literature that I can't help but be excited about it. <laughs> going to be it's yeah. going to be awesome god is doing great things both in my life and in hopefully lots of people's lives uh, lots of authors you're so. getting me excited to read more 
Yeah. Uh, and also, I'm sure that, that some of the people that are listening right now, again, we, ha- we are hosting Erin Brosel, and she's a mother of eight and a Catholic author. And we, we're so blessed to have her here on the show. And uh, I wondered if somebody's listening and thinking, you know, I would love to maybe get involved in writing. Would you have any advice for someone who's new to being a Catholic author? I just wonder, I mean, yes. there's people who would like to get involved in it, but they don't know much. Yes. I guess my first recommendation would be, if at all possible, to join the Catholic Writers Guild and hang out with us. There's a I think a yearly fee of about 35 or $38 to join. And then you get to hang out online. You can do a, um, a chat on Sunday nights. They have a Sunday night chat. You can ask questions, you can get started. If you're near a town that has a writer's conference, I would go to that too. Although it's probably not specifically Catholic writer's conference, but just to get started with your ideas and to hang out with other authors is good, whether you can hang out with them online or hopefully in person later. Um, I, that's how I started too. And I went to a writer's conference, I think way back in 2002 or three here in Columbus, cause Columbus is a big town. So I was able to do that. Um, and I didn't have to spend a lot of money cause it was in my hometown. So that's a nice thing. Um, and to just network and, and like, you know, write your stuff and then edit it later. <laughs> Um, write first, write, get it down. Even if you have to write in the shower or something, that's kind of hard to do. Or, you know, talking to yourself. Some people go for walks and literally talk their books into their phone and then come back later and transcribe it. Um, there's a bunch of ways to get those ideas on paper. And unfortunately, the Holy Spirit likes to nudge a lot of people late at night. So you'll be going to sleep and then you'll get your best ideas. And sometimes I literally jump up and write stuff down because I know I will forget it in the morning. Uh, and I have to get it out on paper. So I I hope that helps. I hope. um, Oh, that's great advice. I mean, because there's a lot of people who are talented in that way, but just don't know how to get involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that brings me also to the topic of talent again, because um, I do think that as a mother and as a homeschooling mother, it's so important that you have opened up your eyes to it because that is an, a really amazing part of being a parent, isn't it? Of being able to see those gifts and talents in each of your kids. It is. It is. And I, I don't like to brag too much about my kids, but I have kind of amazing kids. I'll just tell you, like, so my oldest daughter wants to be an engineer and she scuba dives and she wants to design robotic stuff underwater. I mean, that's just amazing. And my son is a tap dancer and he's really good. He has a world-class teacher who miraculously was able to do this for us. So I'm not spending an utter fortune on it. He tap dances. And my next daughter plays the violin. The next one plays the flute. The next one plays the harp. And my little son, who's eight, is a mechanical genius. He takes everything apart, and I just have to let him. My mom used to tell me the story about Steven Spielberg's mother let him blow up Cherry's Jubilee in the microwave and film it and stuff and do just crazy things. And I have one son who literally, I think, tried to take apart all of his Thomas train set with the little teeny tiny screws in every train. (laughs) And now he's getting so he can put stuff back together. So I knew he'd get there someday. He can build things and do electrical engineering and I'm just, my goal is to help my kids um, do whatever they want, you know, what their talent is. That's so amazing. So. That's so great to hear. I mean, that's amazing. I And and I think your youngest son, hopefully, you'll never have to fish or fix a washer or a dryer, uh, right. you know, ever again. You just, he'll be able to do it for you, you know, another two or three years, I'm sure. Uh-huh. He will, because he watches <laughs> all of the repairmen come to our house and he can <laughs> lay down on the floor with them. <laughs> awesome. Awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I'm glad that you told us about each of your children. Um, that that's really incredible because the more kids you have, right, the more you can see the different like variations of talents. Right. And we had another guest. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lisa Maladnik. Yes. Uh, I've heard yes. Of her. Yeah. Because her specialty is helping people to develop their talents. And I'm always telling people about the great work she's doing too, because it's kind of right in line with everything you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean? It's such a, for, for, um, Bill here, you know, it's a jaw-dropping responsibility to be a parent, but 
if you focus on the fun part of it, eventually you will forget about the sleepless nights <laughs> and the other things <laughs> that go along with raising a, a baby and changing diapers and all that. I've been doing diapers for 20 years and I'm almost done, guys. Yay! <laughs> so, <laughs> it just becomes such a part of your life that y- you don't even have to think about it. There are people who dwell on the bad side of parenting. And I feel like for your podcast, especially Sewing Hope, like we're supposed to be hopeful. Our kids are the future and we only have this time with them to try not to screw up too much. And we all mess up, but to try to focus on the good and read good books to children. That's the motto of Perpetual Light Publishing. Read a good book to a child and light up the night, you know, Mm. light a fire under them. So that's awesome. Hey, do you have any suggestions for any parents that are listening? And we were talking about kids that are kind of those like later readers Is there anything you think that parents can do to get kids more interested in reading that their kids are a little bit more active and not wanting to sit down and be read to and things like that? Well, like you mentioned, audio books are good. A lot of kids don't really want to read so much, but they might like to listen to some or they might like to watch movies on what they're interested in or what you're trying to teach them. I I recommend all that. And I also recommend finding at least one other parent who has a child like yours. That's good advice, right? Because everybody has, there's so many special needs kids right now, unfortunately, but the parents can network like never, never before with social media. And so whatever happens to your child or whatever challenge God hands you, I guarantee you there's somebody else going through it at the same time. And it's a great resource to network online and ask questions or find a good doctor, you know, do what you have to do. And the later readers, are not stupid. That's really important to tell them. Don't ever tell your child <laughs> that they're stupid or that they can't learn because sometimes, unfortunately, they'll, they will hear that from some teacher somewhere or Sunday school teacher or something. And then they think about it later and they, they hold themselves back. I was never good at math, but relearning math with um, Mr. Demi from Math UC. I watched all the DVDs. I did this all with my children. I now know more math than I ever did. And some of it, I thought, why didn't they teach me this? They, nobody ever said it this way, or they didn't. I didn't make the brain connection. And even though I'm older, I'm in my mid forties, I can still learn. And that's a hugely exciting, hopeful thing. Like I can still be taught. Yay. So oh, I know I hear you completely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I agree with you and, and learning can keep going even after the age of 50, 60, 70. I mean, keep going, mm-hmm. keep reading. I mean, uh, so any suggestions then for uh, homeschooling parents too, because you've done such a great job with that. There could be some people listening that maybe they're thinking about doing it, but they don't know how to start. Right. And it is daunting when you first start out, there's been so many parents this year in the time of COVID who had to homeschool and it was a real challenge, but there are homeschooling groups now in, in every state. There's, there's the Ohio homeschooling parents on Facebook. I mean, you can go to them and they have all these files and all the questions that you need to ask how to notify your, your um, local school board that you're homeschooling, all the stuff that you have to do, how to find a, an assessor for the end of the year or buy some tests that you can take and give you administer them to your kids. And, um, I guess I would just say, you know, keep plugging away and rem- remember the goal of like your own personal goal of homeschooling. Why do you homeschool? I homeschool so I can teach my kids about God so we can have a family life together and so that they they can be friends as siblings, even if they have really disparate talents. Family life is the key. And so read to your kids every single day, even if they're older kids and they're 16, but if they still like it, when you read to them, keep going, read them news articles or read them magazines that you like, or just keep reading because an hour spent reading is much better than a whole week watching TV, right? (laughs) So it's very true. And I I love TV too. I'm a film major, but uh, it's very true. I have a really good quote too from uh, Chesterton, who's one of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton. And um, God got, he flipped up on my calendar today. I'm like, oh, this is perfect for the podcast. Chesterton says, merely having an open mind is nothing. The object of opening the mind as of opening the mouth is to shut it again on something solid. <laughs> I love That's that. Good. I love, yeah. I'm a big Chesterton fan. <laughs> yeah. So beautiful. You can see the joy. You you have such joy in your life. I want to uh, definitely recommend to everybody who's listening to connect with you. 
um, especially at perpetuallightpublishing.com. Mm -hmm. Now, is, are there any other links or places that you'd love for people to go to, to, to learn more about the work that you're doing and, and other people too? Um, it would be great if they could read my eighthobbits.com blog. That's a uh, um, www.8, like you spell it out, E-I-G-H-T, hobbits, H-O-B-B-I-T-S.com. And you can find me and Jeannie on Facebook. And let's see, what else? Um, that's pretty much it. And like I said, joining the Catholic Writers Guild, it's growing every year. You guys, we have, I think, over 400 to 500 members. And they're not just in the U.S. They're all over the world. There's international members as well. And we know friends in England and we have people in Germany and um, it's, it's good to find and find your, whatever you want to write about, find your niche, you know, read more about it, try and stay up to date on things. Um, and that's how you start being a writer too. Yeah. You know what? I, I definitely do second that, you know, uh, write, write about something you're passionate about mm -hmm. and then also be, be well read. I mean, you know, we, we have to, I, you know, I think be involved in the culture because we, you know, we, we are, we, we are in, we are in the world, whether we like it or not, you know, uh, we don't have to be of the world, but we got to be in it. And so you ought to know a few things about it and you ought to research, you know, the areas, uh, uh that, that you're interested in, be well read, watch good movies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, read good books, mm -hmm. uh, do, do the, all, you know, all the good television show stuff, you're, you know, you're spot on with it. And, and, and it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what age you are. If you're, you know, if you're out there trying to make an impact, just, just be where, where you're planted, be where, be where God is calling you to be, uh, and, and do your best. So it's just as wonderful to have you on Aaron, it's been so much fun Thanks. talking with you. Your your joy has been absolutely palpable, and uh, we definitely have to have you back on as you continue uh, doing great work for the kingdom. As you release new uh, books, uh, you know, please come back on. We would love to continue talking with you about uh, your your awesome life and, uh, and thank you, and great mission. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it because, as you know, Catholic marketing is kind of hard. It's hard getting the word out about our books. So <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much. Really oh, thank you. It. Such a pleasure. Bill, very well said. I agree with everything that Bill said too. Please do come back, stay in touch with us and God bless you and your beautiful family. Thank you. You guys too. And good luck with the new baby, Bill. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, folks, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this, e this evening and know that we'll be back on Thursday with another episode right here at 6 it's 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. But until then, keep beating to your Catholic hearts and sowing hope into broken hearts. I'm Bill Snyder. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sowing Hope on Patchwork Heart Radio. For more information about this podcast and our ministries, visit our websites, patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com. You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at Ministry or Andy Santos, too. Over 2,000 years ago, two disillusioned disciples walked along a dusty road to Emmaus. They had just witnessed Jesus, their friend and leader, whom they hoped to be the Messiah, suffer a gruesome death by crucifixion. Doubt, 
fear, and uncertainty clouded their conversation as they journeyed home, questioning the future. Until something miraculous happened. The risen Jesus appeared and answered their questions. Today, many young Catholics step onto college campuses with numerous questions about their faith, yearning to know if the seed of faith given to them as a child is both true and practical. Using the miracle on the road to Emmaus as a model, young adult ministers conversed weekly for three months with college students about the most pressing questions they had about the Catholic faith. As they journeyed together virtually, something amazing happened. Doubts disappeared, fears faded, and Jesus revealed that he is still alive. Hearts Burning Within Us, the latest book from Patchwork Heart Ministry, scheduled to be released in the summer of 2021, is a result of that grace-infused conversation. To pre-order your copy and help spread the word about the book, visit patchworkheart.org.